fortunate here that we actually have a group of people who are actively involved in this space for many years. And what I'm going to do first is actually introduce the people, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the context of the session, turn it over to the panelists for some questions, and then ask the audience for questions. And at the tail end, there will be a bit of a wrap up on some of the work that's been going on in this space. And again, I'm going to use the Can we have the first slide? I'm going to use the first report, Bridging the Pioneer Gap, as a starting point, but moving on to the report that we launched today, Beyond the Pioneer, as the ending point. And this panel will actually help bridge that gap itself. So let me just introduce the panelists. I'm going to start with Sanjeev Jha, who is the CEO of IntelliGro. Prior to his role at IntelliGro, Sanjeev was the CFO of IntelliCap and its group companies. Sanjeev brings over 15 years of experience in the finance and investment world, and he has worked with firms like IntelliCap, Low Capital, Actis, and ATS Services. The next is Srijit Nedumpalli, Director of Business Development at Upaya Social Ventures. He oversees the organization Lift Up Project and an incubator program that focuses on entrepreneurs with the potential to be large scale employers in extremely poor communities. Srijit brings over 12 years of experience in entrepreneurship and SME promotion. Simon Desjardins is responsible for Shell Foundation's Access to Energy program, which has the goal of helping to, promise ac to provide access to modern energy services, for the, to bring modern energy services for the poor. Before joining Shell in 2008, Simon has worked globally in a range of businesses and development roles with experience in startups, multinationals, and NGOs. And finally, Paul. Paul Breloff is the founder of, is the founding managing director of Axion Venture Labs. He has advised CEOs <coughs> and has been engaged by Root Capital, Shell Foundation, BRAC, and others on access to finance issues in the developing world. Really fortunate that we have this panel here, and in addition to getting their input on the subject today, what we're really lucky is to have them here to answer questions. Just in terms of format, I'm going to be a little bit hard-nosed about questions. We really want questions and we want people sharing them with the panelists so we can get their opinions. So if you don't mind, when you do ask a question, please keep it restricted to a question and less about your opinion about a bunch of different things. With that, let me start the session. So I think all of you know that we are here because we're interested in poverty and how to solve the challenges of poverty. And as I said a little bit earlier, the launch of our report, the challenges are huge. I don't need to go into them. But all of you know about the magnitude of the problems, whether it is the number of billions of people who are living in poverty, the challenges of health, the challenges of education. And the interesting thing is, I think all of us find the potential for solving these problems with still having a market-based solution hat on is huge. That's what excites us. The problem is that if you look at social enterprises which are trying to do this, things that are commercially viable and socially beneficial, and you look at the scale of where these solutions are versus the scale of the problem, the two don't match up. So we did a piece of work in, 19, in 2011 where we looked at 439 promising social enterprises in Africa. We went to all the experts, we talked to different people in the field and said, which are the best enterprises you know? Things that are, com that are trying to do things commercially, but have social impact. And it's fascinating. We got lots of names, lots of ideas. You talk to them, great organizations. You dig one level deeper. Fascinating idea, but there's still a $300,000 grant from Rockefeller, which is what's keeping it going. Or the customer base is still just the first hundred. When you look at how many of them are actually even commercially viable and at scale, and scale is not even large numbers. We were talking basically, for example, in India, one million people, when we have a base of a billion. We found in Africa, with similar kinds of analogies numbers, 13% were at scale or on the way to scale. And as I mentioned, the problem is much, much larger. So we want to address the problem. There is a need of thinking about scale. And let me be clear, I'm not saying each individual organization has to scale but the answer has to be at scale. So if we start with that framing, why is this happening? Why are these organizations not scaling? 
these are some of the smartest people. It's pretty straightforward at some level. We're asking them to solve the world's toughest problems, problems that neither the private sector nor the government has solved so far. And if you look at level deeper, when you're solving these kinds of problems, you can't just take a routine solution that everybody else has used and ramp it out. You've got to come up with a creative new solution, which is typically not a trivial task. It's not even a trivial task after you have the solution of actually getting it refined and getting it to actually be robust. So the first thing is the business model itself, a non-trivial task. And you need really smart people. So you're talking of good people, good talent. You're talking of money, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But you need to actually get your idea up there and refine it first and foremost. But that's usually not the end. For these kinds of problems, very often the value chain doesn't exist. So as I was mentioning earlier this morning, you're trying to sell a water filter. Where is distribution? There's nobody who stocks water filters. You're trying to sell cook stoves. Where's the distribution? Or in our case, where we were working in housing, I have a house. But who's going to finance this customer? It's literally like telling General Motors, sure, you sell cars, but also, while you're at it, build the gas stations to provide fuel to these cars. So first and foremost, there's the whole challenge of the value chain, which often doesn't exist, that you've got to create. Next level, often the customer doesn't know about the product or know enough about the product, so you've got to generate interest. I want to sell the customer a water filter. He wants to buy a mobile phone. How do I convince him that this water filter is important now, the health benefits to you, your family, will allow you to buy two mobile phones tomorrow. You finally do convince him, and he buys your competitor water filter. What? Why should a small enterprise itself go out and do this public good of creating awareness when it's going to benefit the whole industry? The next layer which comes out is regulation. Regulation is designed to support the incumbent. In fact, it's there for good reasons. You want standards. You want to make sure that people are not cheating the customer. But by definition, most of us are working in the social market-based space. We're coming out with innovative solutions, which are breaking the rules. That's why they're innovative. And regulation doesn't usually favor them. Again, expecting a small social entrepreneur to change regulation. So that's the landscape that I think we all face. First of all, a creative idea and getting it to actually work. Next, thinking about the value chain and putting that together. Next, thinking about the public good that you have to create to get it out there. And last but not the least, thinking about regulation and how do you adapt it. So when you think of that series of barriers, that's what we are facing. And that's what this panel is about. So some of you have the, may have read the report that we wrote called The Pioneer Gap. It really called out this problem and said, you've got to get this model, you've got to get it refined, validate the model, then you've got to go out and prepare the market, put the value chain together, put all the stuff together, and then get it to scale. Now, all the investors want to come in after you've done all the hard work. So how do we get this? Ideas, sure. So on the initial blueprint, a lot of people have ideas. But the two central spaces require non-trivial amount of effort, and it's high risk. So in the pioneer gap, we wrote about this and said, we really need to think about how do we bring in philanthropy to help fill that gap. As we've been looking at that space more, we feel there is more than philanthropy and just money. So that's what the session is going to focus on today. If you're a small social entrepreneur getting out there with a brilliant idea and you want to get to scale, what is the help you need beyond money? The second question we're going to focus on is, even if you did get that help, is it fair to expect you as the organization to solve all these problems, or do we need to look beyond the individual organization? So with those two framing questions, I'm going to go around and ask each of the panelists to give us their thoughts on each of those questions. Then I'm going to actually turn it over to the audience and get questions from you. I've also had a couple of people actually mail us questions, so I do have a few questions in my hip pocket, and I'm also going to give the panelists an opportunity, if they have a burning question, to ask one of the other panelists. Because I know we have some interesting differences of opinion on this panel, and we'll see how to bring some of those out in a constructive way. So with that, I'm actually going to ask Paul to start with his framing, that as he thinks of social enterprises, and he's worked with a range of them in his life, in fact, worked inside them also, to give us an idea of what does he think are the challenges that social enterprises face. Let's start with that beyond money. Great, great. Thanks. It's uh, great to be here. 
feels very formal having us up on this stage with so few of you out there, but hopefully we can have a bit of a <laughs> conversation. Um, so I manage something called Axion Venture Lab. Um, we invest in the world's most innovative financial inclusion startups, um, and we go early. Um, we, we often invest um, at, at a pure idea stage, um, and if a company is past its initial stages of revenue, it's frankly probably too late for us. Um, and, and I think our way of thinking about the world is that um, um, we're really interested in, uh, in developing uh, more opportunities to give people the financial tools that they need to improve their lives. Um, we come, Axion is traditionally focused on microfinance as the way to do that. We are in a changed environment with different technology that really makes it possible to reach people in a lot of different ways with different technology through different institutional forms. And we think startups are exceptionally well poised to drive that innovation. Um, startups are, are nimble, they're, they're, they're hungry, they're disinvested in the status quo, they don't want mind moving quickly, breaking things, and we're there to support and enable them. Um, no question, money is part of the equation, and, and most startups start there and, and uh, uh, immediately recognize if we don't have cash, we can't do anything. Um, as Ashish mentioned, though, there's a lot of other barriers to, to growing, um, and I think that what I'll tell you a little bit about is uh, some of the areas that we see as barriers that we as investors think we can play a role. Um, and, and, and then I think we as a, as a panel and as a, as a group can think more about as we identify these barriers, who's best placed to influence them? Is it the company? Is it other stakeholders like funders or investors? Or is it a broader set of ecosystem or industry actors? Um, so a few of the areas that we're really interested in beyond uh, um, just equity investment, uh, probably the biggest area, no surprise, is human capital. Um, and I think this is something that's now just getting recognized as a massive challenge. Um, we're interested in lots of different ways that we can more effectively connect the supply and demand of talent um, in the market. And I think we're thinking about some different, uh, as investors, um, across our portfolio, more effective ways that we can identify the right people to fill the right positions. I think this is an area that um, CEOs often underestimate and underinvest in um, because they're, they're so quick to just focus on the business. Really, people are everything in the early stages. Um, another thing we're really excited about is figuring out a more effective way to support our companies after we've invested um, by providing direct management bandwidth support. We've launched a new function internally led by Tahira, who's in the, in the audience, um, focused uh, on portfolio engagement. And really, we hate this term capacity building or capacity development, as if our entrepreneurs are unintelligent and need to be, have their hands held through things. We invest in really, really smart, talented entrepreneurs, but there's not enough time in the day for them to do all the things that they could possibly do um, that would actually influence the business. So Tahira and as a group, we're looking at ways that short-term, quick interventions can really guide the trajectory of the business, both in terms of its business success and its impact. So looking at ways that if we can get in and do a great job with a customer segmentation or prioritizing a customer pipeline for an enterprise sales organization or something like that, we can channel the energy that does exist on the team much more effectively and do it in a way that's really quick that reduces the friction and the transaction cost. So there are great consulting firms out there, um, but uh, for a lot of our startups, it might be too expensive and it might take too long to get them uh, um, geared up and, and, and ready to go and negotiate the contract and, and, and teach them. If we can identify a problem on Tuesday, talk to the entrepreneur on Wednesday and get started Thursday, that's pretty exciting. So this whole idea of portfolio engagement. Another area I won't belabor because I think Sanjeev's going to talk about, we invest a lot in uh, startup lending institutions, non-bank finance companies in India, addressing niche customer segments. Um, Microfinance has been great, but obviously is not addressing the full range of credit needs in a market as big as India. Um, and a lot of really interesting models are springing up to focus on particular um, um, small business segments. We invested in a company called Barthana, which lends to low-cost private schools in the market. Um, other small and medium enterprises, Canara Capitals here, um, um, different online uh, 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 businesses, all of them struggle to access wholesale debt capital in the first couple years they exist. 
Um, they do not have uh, the right uh, portfolio vintage. They haven't broken even. They're an unknown quantity and banks don't want to lend. Um, we're looking to create a guarantee facility that can work across all of these different companies rather than make each company go and figure this out um, from the beginning themselves. There's other solutions for that. IntelliGrow's there and that's fantastic and our companies work with IntelliGrow. Um, but IntelliGrow is not going to possibly be able to cover the whole scope of need. So if we can do that at a structural level by using guarantee structures, standby letters of credit, um, maybe that's, that's an answer. The last thing I'll mention, and then I'll shut up, um, is the idea of how we can promote more external, externalities, lessons learned, demonstration effect. As I said before, we think startups are really well poised to experiment, to drive, to drive some new ideas, to see what works and what doesn't. And we're excited about the way that those activities actually influence the broader market. Crowd in more people, inspire copycats, make it easier for those people who come later to, uh, to, to innovate on top of what's been done before. That can only happen if there's linkages and, and, and lessons learned between what happens on the ground in these enterprises and, and the broader ecosystem and the broader industry. Um, and not surprisingly, there's a real tension there because the startups, once they've figured something out, don't often want to share it. We as investors want our companies to work out. We don't often want to give up our competitive edge. This is a place that probably we need to think more about industry level um, uh, um, uh, functions and resources so that these ideas that happen can be shared much more effectively across the industry. Um, so there's probably more we could talk about in regulation and other areas, but those, those are a few of the areas. We're actually trying to build a function that focuses on that, that not only does some of this internal knowledge generation, lessons learned, sharing, um, but also uh, liaises with the right groups um, in terms of more in-depth research, dissemination, et cetera. So I'll stop there as a few of your Thanks a lot. Um, Simon, would love to get your thoughts on what do you need beyond money for the companies that you work with? Sure. So very quickly, um, for those in the room who aren't familiar with us, we're, um, Shell Foundation supports early stage, seed stage, uh, disruptive innovation. And that innovation typically comes in the form for us for in uh, for-profit enterprises. So we typically back entrepreneurs in the energy infrastructure and mobility uh, spaces um, to go from that pre-seed seed stage to the point where they can scale. So our partnerships tend to last for five, six, seven plus years. Um, we're an unusual foundation in that we work with a small number of partners. Uh, we cut a small number of checks. We also use grant funding as, an inst as our primary instrument to support those first movers. We believe that first movers, those disruptive innovators, actually have a first mover disadvantage to uh, getting into their business, especially when the market is unproven, when the business model is unknown. Um, and the idea is that we help de-risk that, that, that early stage pioneer that wouldn't have otherwise been able to come into the market just purely with commercial capital. Um, our model is also to work heavily with businesses beyond capital, which is the topic of today. And just to build on Paul's point, uh, we're fortunate enough as an organization to, to look at the sector at a 39,000 foot level and not just think about what does an individual business need beyond capital, but what does the whole sector need beyond, uh, beyond capital. Um, part of that is, uh, I mean, we're all here uh, at, at SanCalp at an at a, at a organization, institution that has um, convened everybody. There's, there's something around convening and I think you're all here not to listen to us, but probably because of who is going to be at this uh, conference. It's one, or one, one example. We actually helped fund the first SanCalp uh, Africa uh, that, re that recently happened. We think there's a value in that. Um, there's also value, I think, in, in helping uh, small businesses that are getting off the ground that don't have the, the time, as Paul was mentioning, to think about um, business development and risk at a, at a national level or international level. How does a, how does a small resource-constrained organization think about international expansion? Um, how do they think about um, risks, uh, reputational risks, safety risks? These very unsexy co uh, concepts that tend to be totally forgotten, legal risks, uh, but tend to come back to bite organizations uh, down, the, down the line. So we work on, on that a fair bit. And then a lot of these industries are so new, and I guess that there's a lot of financial inclusion players here in the room and also in the panel, um, where these industries are, are formed by a bunch of pioneering startups, but there's no standards. There are no industry bodies, typically, that are there to support those organizations at a, as a whole. How do, we, how do we speak as one voice, as a subsector, to policymakers, to regulators? How do we ensure that, there's a, that, that <laughs> the government is going to turn around tomorrow and sort of put everybody um, in a particular subsector out of business? That's a risk that we've got to be thinking about, I think, as a, as a sector. So 
worth, um, we help back the uh, Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves on the cookstove side. Um, we're now thinking about and likely going to be back in the Global Alliance um, or the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association or GOGLA, which is looking at, at energy product companies. So there's, need, there's a need for more uh, public or public benefit institutions, uh, these industry bodies that probably don't have a business model that is scalable behind them, but we believe have an enormous public benefit in existing. Um, and that kind of institution and intervention, I think, is probably uh, pretty well suited to, to grant. Um, and tends to get tends to get forgotten. So, um, but I'll, I'll I'll hand it over. I'm going to move it over to Shrijit and yeah. put your thoughts on beyond money. What do organizations? Sure, that's just, yeah. And especially because you know a lot of the focus tends to be of money initially. Yes. Yeah. So uh, first of all, good morning and great to be here. So just taking on from where uh, you left, Simon left. So we also believe this uh, this particular challenge has to be addressed at two levels. One is at the zero feet level, as we put it, and then at the 10,000 feet level. So uh, we at Upaya, we basically come at the zero feet level, uh, what we call in bridging that pioneering gap, where capital, of course, is a part of it, but it uh, goes beyond uh, money as well. Uh, so uh, beyond money, money, of course, is a part, but beyond money, we provide, we work with uh, entrepreneurs, and that too, many of them in smaller towns, like places like Bhagalpur in uh, Bihar or Lucknow or Babpeta, a small town in Assam. Uh, these places we provide hands-on mentoring to uh, the entrepreneurs there. And uh, basically, I mean, uh, at that level, at the, uh, at the pioneering enterprises level, as you rightly put it, they go through a number of changes at the early stages. The business model gets changed, the early assumptions get questioned, and uh, changes every time, the financial modeling needs repeated at a first to actually fine tune. And that needs, uh, it's again uh, not really right to expect them to uh, take all that responsibility uh, with them. So what we have basically done is we have built a team with different expertise and we work uh, very deeply and intensely with these enterprises, helping them whether it is uh, preparing the financial model or even to understand their own uh, customers or their own beneficiaries. Uh, do a baseline and then see year after year how the beneficiaries actually, how they progress, or to fine tune their market strategy or even to prepare their uh, market strategy uh, and facilitate networking, facilitate partnerships. Some of the challenges are common like working capital financing or uh, branding or how do we prepare in the market communication materials. So these are again areas, some of the areas we uh, ourselves cannot do that, so we need to bring in other uh, service providers and facilitate. So this is all part of the, the pioneer uh, gap at that stage and along with that money that uh, needs to be addressed. So that's what uh, we have been doing for the last two years. We have partnered with six enterprises uh, in India and uh, probably will be adding six, seven in this year. And one, uh, one I mean, unique thing is that they're all mostly from smaller towns and great models, well-educated uh, entrepreneurs with a lot of aspirations. And they have, I mean, many of them are uh, truly pioneers in the sectors they uh, work in and uh, scalable models, but scalability needs to be addressed at that level. But coming to the other level, the 10,000 feet level, which uh, I mentioned, in fact, I yesterday had, I met about six, seven enterprises here, and one common challenge most of them had was, in, for example, in consumer finance. And... Uh, one, I mean, that's, I think it's a kind of sector industry-wide uh, challenge here, and there are a few players uh, trying to address that, like Kinara and Intelligro. But uh, one big gap faced by many of these entrepreneurs is that for our customers to access our uh, product or buy our product, there needs to be consumer finance, and where is the consumer finance? And similarly, the other bigger challenge, one of the questions we keep getting is that recruiting talented individuals, how do we build team? And again, there are a few examples, like there are fellowships offered by a uh, few will grow kind of uh, organizations, but there needs to be more of them. And uh, branding, or uh, we talked about that as in packaging, branding, or in areas. So yes, at that level, once you work with a number of uh, enterprises, uh, you can also facilitate, there needs to be a kind of critical number for even these other service providers to come in and provide that uh, support. And so for that, again, you need models which work with the social enterprises at that uh, zero-fit level 
create a critical number of those SMEs so that other service providers can then come in and then uh, take it forward. Yeah, that's pretty much what we Thank you. <coughs> yeah, I think I forgot the question. The basic question here was that when you're looking at all the enterprises you work with and you come in with a lens of actually giving them wholesale debt, yeah. but you obviously get to know them closely when you're working with them, right. both in the initial evaluation stage and then as you're working with them. Right. So beyond the money that you're providing them, what do you see as the biggest barriers they face? If you could just list some of those barriers. Sure, that would be sure. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, let me reintroduce Intelligro for the audience over here. Uh, uh, Intelligro uh, was set up about 20, 24 months back with an intent of providing debt to early stage enterprises. And uh, uh, when we uh, thought of setting up Intelligro, the biggest challenge that we found that while for the early stage enterprises there are uh, grant money available or equity uh, investors available, but uh, the money that is required to scale and move to the next level was not available. And uh, that was very, very critical. Uh, critical from two, three standpoints. One biggest standpoint was that uh, while they were scaling and they were growing and uh, majority of the money which was stuck in working capital uh, and some of the money got stuck in financing their uh, uh, growth and others. So, uh, which typically required equity financing and which was dilutive in nature. Uh, so, so Intelligro was set up to effectively bridge that gap and the intent over there was to uh, see how well we can facilitate the company from moving one level to the other. So I'm trying to come to the answer. Uh, what we think and, and we believe that even though we are about uh, 20, 24 month old company, we ourselves uh, are to learn quite a lot. And, and when it comes to capacity development or, or other things, we, we ourselves are, are very new to it and it's a very pretty young team. And uh, 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 we do not think we are uh, 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 talented enough or qualified enough to go out and train our entrepreneurs. But what we can actually effectively do is the following. Uh, and before I say that, and I must tell you that uh, we have lent to about 40 enterprises across six, seven sectors that we operate. And all our entrepreneurs are first generation entrepreneurs. So, the biggest contribution that we believe that we want to bring on the table over here is, can we create entrepreneurship over here? Can we encourage young guys uh, to uh, go to the path of uh, creating their own business? And how would they do it? And if they don't have money uh, to do it on their own, and they're pretty much dependent upon equity or grant, and barring the grant, which is important for the first uh, uh, few, phase, few initial uh, uh, time frame, uh, they did need to raise equity, and it is dilutive. So over a period of time, what really happens, the guy who started the business and uh, he has taken the enterprise to a scale and he has diluted to a very minimum percentage, two to five percent, effectively the manager's salary. So he's not no more the entrepreneur. So we uh, intend to ensure that he owns the company to a greater extent, to longer duration of time, so that the intent and the mission and vision with he started the enterprise, uh, he's able to uh, continue for a longer period of time because uh, it is not the investor's uh, intent uh, or mission that he is trying to fulfill. He is what he is wanted to do, and therefore the investor have invested. So if he's not under control of the company for a longer period of time, it is very, very difficult to uh, 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 do what he wanted to do. So our contribution, we believe, is that. Uh, second thing which we believe that we want to really contribute uh, in playing a role is if we can, uh, as a lender, as a, as a venture debt provider, can we try to uh, lend uh, through asset class? Uh, while there are uh, banks and maybe IFMR, uh, they lend through asset class, but the asset class primarily is uh, towards a distribution lending business like microfinance, uh, uh, microfinance plus uh, models. But can we create asset class in an ATM industry? Uh, uh, can we create an asset class in a, a, a hospital chain industry? Can we create an asset class in uh, solar, PV, and other. So, so that is where we want to create and why I'm seeing asset class, because what really happens is the ecosystem approach of lending uh, is not there, uh, at least at this point in time in India. And uh, to give you an example, if we start lending to an ATM uh, outsourcing company, is there a way that we can connect all their dots and, and actually finance all their vendors, all their uh, uh, interrelated uh, parties? Uh, so that way we will be able to really reduce the cost uh, for, for, for providing that services to quite extent. And uh, while we might sound expensive, but at the same time if you are able to over an asset class approach reduce the cost for the overall that's asset class, uh, 
that will be our uh, biggest contribution. We have not yet done. We intend to do it this year. Uh, but beyond that, I don't think we can play a role in uh, helping the HR structure or finance or cash flows. It's very difficult and might be easier said than, than done. I think, Sanjeev, it's not necessarily you helping. I think just your observations with these companies. Right. What yes. other things do they need beyond debt? So as you mentioned HR, you mentioned uh, is there other things that come to mind as you think about them. Yeah, no, so uh, what we also believe is that if he's an entrepreneur, he's obviously uh, trying to do everything on his own. And when he's growing, uh, in, the, in that initial few years, it's very difficult uh, for him to concentrate on all the, all the things that is necessary to build the organization. And therefore, he need to gradually learn to outsource, while it might sound expensive from the beginning, or maybe hire the best talent possible, uh, outsource the best quality finance function, and not really dependent upon closing the book only on 31st March, and really not write the book through the year. So he must be disciplined enough uh, uh, to close the books month on month, because that brings out a uh, lot of comfort to external people putting in the money. And I know that it's very difficult to hire at that point in time, so they can outsource to my CFO kind of firm. Uh, the HR needs to be outsourced uh, if it is not possible for the firm to absorb in the initial phase. Or so, plug HR is a very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, famous uh, outsourcing HR firm for early stage enterprises that I have seen. So, I think these two functions are pretty important for any any early stage enterprise to really focus from the very beginning and not wait for seven, eight years to start. Can I add a quick uh, anecdote to this, uh, sure. Ashish? I, I would say that. Intelligor, if I can, is, is a, a bit of an outlier in the sense that because uh, debt to small businesses in India is so extremely rare, the fact that Intelligro exists is, in fact, in my view, a, a benefit to the sector. And the anecdote here is that when we were trying to raise, or we were helping Sanjeev raise debt for the first time, there were numerous investors, some of whom are probably at Suncalp this year, um, who all claim to be early stage uh, you know, debt in, in investors did not believe that Intelligro could raise debt. They said, where are you going to raise debt? You can raise equity, you're not going to be able to raise debt. The fact that, so, and Intelligro was unusual in the sense that we had a resource to get over that hurdle and prove that we could, but imagine being a, 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 a financial inclusion startup. Imagine being somebody who's never done or never um, organized or, or run a business before. The fact that they can't point to a source of scale-up cap capital is in fact a barrier to um, bring in a lot of these, these entrepreneurs in the, in the first place. Right. So I think the, 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 just simply the public benefit of being a first mover or being that initial disruptor is in fact a benefit beyond how we usually think about capital provided to the market. So thank you all because I think this very well set up for actually opening it up to the audience. But I just want to summarize a couple of points because I think it was universal here that everybody actually, when you think of the barriers they laid out, first and foremost was talent. Everybody said it. And in other variations, I heard management bandwidth. <coughs> so these are the kinds of things that the individual organization needs and investors, et cetera, are thinking about setting up for them. But what was interesting was also the set of questions which went beyond that, which is debt for the whole industry. And in fact, Sanjeev, what you made out is very clear is that it's not even just for everyone. There are different kinds of debt because there are different kinds of risk profiles for different subsectors within each industry. And what's interesting here is you also pointed out the thing, um, Srijit, about consumer finance. Again, rather than each company do its own consumer finance, can somebody provide it across that space? So does every cook stove company have to create its own finance company to finance cook stoves? So I think right in the panel, we've had a good mix of focus on an individual company like HR, et cetera, and broader, which actually go across the industry. And I think it's unique to actually have Sanjeev here, who is actually trying to answer that question. Now, rather than spend more time with the panel, it would be good to actually get questions from the audience. Anyone would like to ask a question? And if you have a specific first, so two things. One is just put, give us your name. And then if there's a specific panelist you want to have answered the question, do that. Otherwise, I'll select somebody. Go ahead. My name is Arul, and uh, this question is actually generally to the panelists is that uh, when I speak to entrepreneurs, I host a radio show for entrepreneurship, and you know the basic thing about outsourcing and all, you know, there is not an ecosystem of people who really understand startup entrepreneurs in terms of service providers themselves, like a CAs and you know HR people. There are very few people who really understand the temperament, you know, have the temperament to deal with startup entrepreneurs, especially in rural areas, because people coming from rural areas or even you know not the second tier cities. They, you know, they have not been exposed to the urban, you know, most of the CAs speak great English and they use great terms, you know, all these balance sheets and profit and loss. 
you know, what an entrepreneur just wants is how much money is going to come in and how much money is going to go out, you know. So the understanding of the level or the stage at which the entrepreneur is, is also not, is missing. So do you think that it's required that you create a temperament of these people who actually provide these services? So I'm going to ask Sriji that because he's the one who deals with it on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting you said that because in some of, our, uh, some of the cases we worked with, uh, uh, in the case of some of our partners, we even had to actually work a lot with their chartered accountants. And we even had cases where <coughs> the chartered accountants could not understand valuation beyond book value. And uh, <coughs> so, yeah, it's very much part of our work. And that's why I said, I mean, we need to work a lot with the entrepreneurs and also their immediate ecosystem, whether it is the chartered accountants or legal counsels or in the, uh, in the, uh, the most urgent compliance, whether it is uh, taxation or things like that. And um, that, again, uh, I come back to the same point that we need to, I mean, uh, you're quite right, we need to be, uh, widen the SME base and so that it, it needs a critical number and more and more enterprises need to come out and then only, I mean, some of these things will get addressed on its own. And if we widen that SME base, then slowly, I mean, there will be, I mean, more scale and more other service providers and um, even uh, some of the other uh, uh, well-known players will get interested in that because suddenly there is a big number, a critical number there. But till we reach there, I mean, there are models required to work deeply with the entrepreneurs and that is where I believe truly the pioneer gap lies to how do we really, one is of course the capital, the patient capital, but along with the patient capital, how do you provide hands-on mentoring and facilitation uh, to the entrepreneurs. And that's something, yes, that's a challenge and that's something we try to do at Upaya. But, I mean, we certainly need more models and more organizations to work at that level. Thanks, Shijay. I think the whole idea of actually getting an ecosystem going, you need more critical mass to get providers. And I'll just bring an analogy here which actually happened with the microfinance space. So, again, I don't know how many of you know about that. But it was fascinating because you had all these really smart people like Vijay Marjan and a um, um, bunch of the other people at that time. And it's fascinating because as soon as one guy figured out the solution, that chartered accountant went and told all the other people that it could be done. And that's how word mm. of mouth actually spread. And I think that's what we start needing in these sectors also. So I remember Padmaja telling us how she cracked getting people money earlier without actually having to go through a detailed group formation. And the next day, Cher was copying it. So there's this whole thing about actually copying and you train this chartered accountant on actually doing, converting from an NBA, from a NGO to an NBFC, and then suddenly he's the same person providing services to all your competitors. So it's a matter of getting out there, setting the examples that other people can actually Absolutely. follow. Not a question, an observation and a suggestion. Uh, I'm Sanjay Banka from Banka Bailu. I have my lender, Intelligro, here, and uh, you know, a few entities who work with Intelligro. Um, so one point is uh, what Intelligro, or rather you know, venture debt firms of that kind, they bring in discipline you know, to the, in the, into the enterprise. So for instance, uh, insisting on the financial reporting monthly is something which forces the enterprise to see where it stands on a monthly basis compared to let's say once a year, twice a year or probably quarterly. So that's one good thing. Probably they may not be able to help in operations or otherwise, which is fine. But yesterday, yes, we were suggested on the MyCFO stuff, uh, Sanjeev. Thank you. Uh, the suggestion part is, uh, now that you, know, you all are here, uh, how about bringing the cost of debt down for yourselves and ultimately for us? <laughs> See, it's a function of the balance sheet, you know. I mean, our balance sheet is quite uh, small at this point in time. So if we are able to increase our balance sheet faster, we'll be able to pass it on. So at this point in time, uh, we are unable to pass it on because ours is little expensive, ours. I'm actually going to ask anybody else on the panel like to answer the question. Paul, would you like to think about how can we actually reduce the cost of debt? Yeah, no, we're in favor of IntelliGro charging lower interest <laughs> rates. That would be, uh, that would be great. It is, but it is a very, very challenging issue. Um, um, the cost of capital for, uh, for, for anyone is very high in this market. Um, savings accounts give you 8 to 10%. Um, um, and so the, uh, if the risk-free rate is, 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 is that high, of course capital is going to be expensive. Um, we don't have an answer. Uh, we'd like to see um, more mechanisms that we can channel uh, foreign, socially motivated uh, providers into this market. ECB restrictions make that particularly difficult for India. 
Um, but we'd like, to, we'd like to figure out ways. We think there's some creative things that might get done. Um, some things we're exploring might be around uh, a different uh, pay for results frameworks. Um, if the, if, if, if the, let's say the lending institution is in a sector that people care about and you can link loans or activities to particular social outcomes, perhaps there's ways that the lowered interest rate could actually be funded in a way that's margin neutral for, for lenders like, like uh, Intelligro. Um, so we're very interested in figuring that out. Um, there's no question that uh, uh, we can't bring down interest rates for end customers until we first bring down uh, the cost of capital for the, for the wholesale lenders. I can I see Srijit is also yeah, yeah. interested in this that, question. That. See, for me, the question of cost of capital when it comes to debt is linked to two factors. One, we need more debt products, a suitable product. What is the, right now, I mean, it's the, just the vanilla term loan. So how do we bring in more different products, like for example, receivables financing or uh, uh, so on and so forth. The other big factor here is, see, there is a lot of resources available with the public sector banks. How do we create access? And there are again few efforts, I mean, happening here and there, like providing guarantee when it comes to consumer financing and so on and so forth. But if we can create models of creating access to that uh, public sector resources uh, and also, I mean, have more I mean, suitably customized products, then that can have a bearing on the cost. No, so one, one, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So on the cost, let me uh, just give you some numbers. Uh, the inflation rate is around seven, eight percent. Your dollars, dollar rupee is around sixty rupees, right? And uh, about a couple of years back, even a year back, the NCDs that used to come into microfinance sector uh, was, I guess, uh, between eleven to twelve percent. Right now, it is around sixteen percent. Now, if the inflation is that, and the bank is lending at thirteen, fourteen, fifteen percent. <coughs> How can an intermediary sell lesser than that? Impossible. And if you have to add provisioning to that, around 3%, you're already at 18%. And then you add margin. So it is impossible, actually, to bring it down. But what really happens is uh, if the balance sheet size increases, then the equity that has come in or other forms of money that has come in, it lowers the operational expenses. And therefore, the ability to pass it on increases. So a lot to do with economy as well, not to do only with the intermediaries. I think somebody else from the audience wants to ask if we can get. My name is Royston from Grameen Capital. Uh, one of the time-tested ways of reducing costs is increasing competition. <laughs> I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm saying that in jest, but we are launching our own debt vehicle uh, pretty soon. Not that that uh, would help, but I'm thinking about two or three specific areas that uh, you know Sanjeev and myself and uh, you know we discussed even with. Uh, the Shell Foundation yesterday, is how do we as a body look at some of the key pain points? I think the fact of bank access, or bank funding access to wholesalers like us, if there's a mechanism to treat that funding as priority sector lending, then it immediately opens the floodgates. And we've seen that happen in the microfinance sector. How easy or difficult is this for us to come together as, and advocate that type of treatment? And then we would find the cost of funding to us reduced which then uh, would be gladly passed on as benefit uh, to people like yourself. The other one is the one that Paul sort of talked about, which is uh, guarantees and SPLCs, and how do we really leverage uh, that funding source, because uh, ECBs still are a bit of a constraint, but how do we use alternative creative ways to do that? And possibly the third was, uh, is to look at, you know, as we've, so we've started with Grameen Capital India and then added now a debt uh, you know, vehicle and then putting in maybe a, an equity vehicle and then a social stock exchange. How do we open this to a more retail uh, access of funds to be able to really create uh, the right pipes for this to flow in? Because there is a market, there are corporate houses, uh, as he's mentioning, there are other in institutions that are ready to do this, but we just need to create enough of track record. And so people like Sanjeev and his team and others who are doing this are building credibility in asset classes that we would then see. So let's put out that ecosystem uh, within the capital segment itself, if you double click, you will find many pieces that still need attention. Anybody else wants to speak on the issue of debt? I uh, just want to specify debt. I have a quick uh, question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, one reason for high cost of capital is very high cost of wholesale capital, then the regulatory cost, provisioning, and, and, and so on and so forth. Do you guys think that there's a possibility of an alternate structure, uh, which is less heavily regulated, cheaper. Um, I know India's regulations are very different from the rest of the world, but maybe a peer-to-peer -peer type uh, framework or a NCD uh, framework where 
you know, you'll directly link a, a lender to the borrower using the NCD structure. So see, I mean, this model is there, and for example, I believe Milab, Rangde, and uh, Microgram and other players are trying to do it. The challenge over there, I must tell you, is uh, uh, they're small at this point in time, and therefore it does not attract regulators. But uh, it certainly uh, calls for a lot of FEMA uh, requirements. And very simple, money in India can come through two sources, okay, other than grant and others. So let's not talk about FCRA. Let's talk about other commercial forms of money coming in. Either it is ECB or it is FDI. There's no other form, right? If it is ECB, you have to follow that. If it is FDI, you have to follow that. If a, if a lender direct, if, a, if somebody who is a, outside the country directly uh, through a website uh, uh, lending to a borrower, it must attract FEMA requirements. Today it is, nobody is catching it because with the number that we are talking, size that we are talking is very, very small. But uh, that is a really unscalable model, impossible to scale. And you can do charity like that, but not really a scalable business. And therefore, the benefits of that are very short-lived. So I think it's interesting. I just want to sum this up quickly. I think the issue of debt is important. It's one which is not an individual organization, but across organizations. Thanks to IntelliGrow, we actually have solutions. The question is now, how do we get more of them in? Because IntelliGrow <coughs> cannot answer everybody's need, as well as how do we lower the cost of capital. And I think it's interesting just thinking of some of the solutions. The idea of actually building up more information on an asset class, so you understand the risk and you can actually reduce the cost of debt to that particular asset class. Getting players, and again, sort of graduating in that, PSU, banks, et cetera, who have large funds by showing the confidence in the asset class, and then actually moving into a completely different realm, as Paul was saying. Can we get other players who are interested in those social outcomes to actually pay for part of this, so results-based frameworks? And I think last but not the least, the point that you raised, competition. So I'm just going to go off on an anecdote. We do a lot of work with housing finance, and one of our housing finance companies is a company called Micro Housing Finance, very socially driven. There are 10 lenders out there. Many of the others are not quite that socially driven. We notice that in any developer project, when MHFC goes in, the rates drop by 2%. So competition is always there. And I think with more players, with all these different things, it's an interesting potential pathway to get there, which goes above the individual organization and solves the problem for the industry. Let me open it up to other questions. Anyone else has a question? There's one right here. Who's my player? Hi. Um, I'm Sylvie. I work for Unlimited. And actually, um, this conversation, this panel discussion is really, really interesting for me. Because uh, what we do at Unlimited is actually that we fund and mentor uh, social entrepreneurs on both sides. And I'm really happy to hear about IntelliGrow. I didn't know about you guys. And um, actually what you say is that since you're um, in this business only for 24 months, if I understood that correctly, is that you're not that comfortable with mentoring. Um, well, we do funding as well as mentoring, but for this funding, we ask foundations to fund us, of course. Um, so I think with the two of us, we could, well, at least speak further about it, but I think that could form a perfect combination to help you with the mentoring part and yeah, see what's, what's possible. We've been the, doing this for the last seven years with about 200 entrepreneurs right now. So I just wanted to say, let's talk further and see sure. what, uh, whatever our possibilities are there. Great, good collaboration. Uh, any other questions from people in the audience? Hi, uh, my name is Ethan. I work with Vera Solutions. And my question is about the role of technology. Um, a lot of the technology, technology um, a lot of social startups don't have the resources to really build out a large and uh, complex um, information system. And so to, to track loans or monitor performance. And so the, the social startups that you work with and are, and are supporting, how are you finding that they are using innovative ways to bridge that technology gap as well as the financial gap? Sure. I think that uh, um, uh, technology is obviously an enabler of all sorts of things. Um, um, there's a lot of, I think one of the first things is, is figuring out whether or not technology is core to your actual business. Do you need technology early? Is that going to be uh, uh, form a lot of your competitive advantage? If so, you got to, you got to invest in it, and you got to invest in it early. Um, I do think there's a lot happening in terms of open source um, that can be that can be tapped into. And the other obvious thing to highlight is just the rise of, of, of cloud and, and 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 software as a service, 
really transforms the economics of getting started. Um, because whereas uh, even a few years ago, you'd have to invest in, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a full tech integration, a, a, a server stack, et cetera, you can now completely variableize your technology costs in, in, in most cases, get started with a lot less than you had in the future. Um, so I do think there's options out there. Um, it is a good question. When do you invest? How much do you invest? Um, that comes back down to more um, um, strategic questions than anything else. But I do think across open source, cloud, there's, there's, some, there's some new options in the market. Also, just to throw another approach to that from a different angle, is I think generally, make a general statement, is that we, we, we tend to see entrepreneurs not asking for support beyond funding from corporates or from vertical experts within a particular sector. I think there are a lot of corporates out there with a lot of technical expertise, whether it's a Shell or a Google, who we actually were meeting with this morning. Um, and a lot of these guys, I think, want to support social enterprises beyond funding. It's probably very difficult for a lot of them to cut a check, but for them to deploy some of their expertise to support a business is probably um, much more possible. And I think we don't see enough entrepreneurs being aggressive and asking for what they need. They assume it's got to, they've got to pay for it or they assume that they've got to raise equity funding or, or, or other kind of funding to, to do it. But there are other options out there. Yeah, we learned this morning about google.com slash nonprofits and apparently there's all sorts of free stuff on there yeah. that I didn't know about until today. Um, Shriji, I know you were nodding your head on the technology side and you actually work with companies in tier two areas and far more challenging environments. Do you again see the same need and push for technology? I tend to agree with uh, both Simon and Paul here that, I mean, the obvious thing about technology is to understand your requirements and not to overdo this. <clears throat> and then once you understand, so there again, I mean, uh, certainly entrepreneurs need support to understand the technology requirement. And again, second is not to reinvent the wheel. Uh, sometimes they look at a very specific micro requirement and they are unable to come up slight they are unable to slightly generalize that. And if you uh, slightly go above the specific requirement, then there are solutions already available which can be easily customized to uh, them. So look at the existing solutions and uh, most of the time my experience is that whether it is Google or by bringing in individual uh, experts or mentors who can work with the companies, the technology challenges can be addressed pretty cost effectively uh, and whatever solution they need, whether it is for MIS or for uh, uh, customer interaction, or uh, um, particularly through mobile, uh, in the mobile platform, it can be uh, uh, created. And, but as they grow, the requirement also changes, and it's a continuous process. Did that help, or not really? It'd be better if we could just pay for your technology. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to get there. Like when I, just a quick anecdotal example is my colleague Anu Bhavnani, who's in the room today, set up a, a pro bono partnership with Ernst & Young, who's now supporting multiple Shell Foundation partners uh, pro, pro bono, um, including Intelligro mm -hmm. and others. So it, 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 their, their interest is simply to d deploy their talent in a way that is adding public benefit uh, to the market. So it's, it's, I think there are lots of opportunities like that out there. And just one more to add. Again, when we talk about technology, we normally talk about IT technology, but there is more to technology. And uh, there is more, so one of our uh, partners, they have actually, I mean, recently come up with a kind of innovative dryer. Uh, and uh, another one is actually making papers and they are uh, innovating uh, 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 some technology to make paper uh, from natural fiber and dung and uh, such materials. So there again, it's... Uh, it's possible to get individual experts or mentors to work with them and also to create, in, our, in this particular case, one partner has already developed a technology and we connected them with another partner who is looking for a similar kind of uh, technology and it worked out well for them to uh, get that idea. So uh, the point is we need to also look at other technology requirements and where technology can play a role and uh, how to facilitate that. I know there were some more questions on this side. Anyone else here wants to? Hi, I'm Paroma from Unlimited. I just wanted to touch upon the issue of social capital. So drawing from your past experiences, 
What do you think connector organizations or network building organizations can do more to support early stage social entrepreneurs? Thank you. Good question. And again, I think it gets to the fact of going above the individual organization, which is the connector organization and the roles they play. Um, Srijit, any thoughts on that? Uh, so, I do not get the question. Can you uh, repeat the question? The question is basically connector organizations that are unlimited that actually help mentoring, etc. What kind of role can they play in the social space? So, it will be a bit of a repetition, but I, if I think of, I mean, specific two or three, one, uh, working with each enterprise, they need to, uh, as I was mentioning, at that stage, at the initial stage, their business model changes, assumptions changes, they need to be able to, in fact, one of the in my earlier discussion with Ashish, was, there was an interesting point about outsourcing training. And when it comes to uh, businesses about outsourcing training, uh, we are basically talking about whether to focus at the core competency or whether to outsource. And even at that level, what to outsource and whether my business model requires me to focus at my core competency and uh, if I have to outsource, then who else provides the service and what can I outsource. At this level, there's, there needs a lot of intense working with the entrepreneurs and that's all, I mean, we can call it even preparing them uh, for scale. And so one, one is working with that entrepreneur at that level. The second is, and if we can do this at a scale, and uh, that in itself is a challenge, how do we really work with 100 enterprises at this scale or 100, 200 or 1000 enterprises? But then slowly a critical mass has to be created for many others to actually then come up with specific solutions. If it is training and if there are 100 organizations, uh, crafts organizations need a particular training, then naturally more entrepreneurs will come offering that particular training support. So in each area, whether it is financing or training or HR uh, or in uh, any other area, there needs critical mass to be generated for others to come up with business models addressing that particular challenge. And in creating that critical mass and in highlighting that particular requirement, that again, I mean, uh, the connecting organizations can play a bigger role. I think, I think I'd like to see um, these connector organizations and whatnot be a bit more deliberate and focused. Um, I sometimes, I mean, network capital, relationships, very critical to success uh, in this space. I sometimes worry there's way too much connecting, just sort of haphazardly happening without it really being focused on particular needs of an organization. Um, we work in financial inclusion. Um, some of the things that we wish and we, that we cultivate ourselves are the right kinds of connections to the people within Visa and MasterCard and Airtel and, and you know, ICICI, so that when our companies need particular business relationships, um, um, connections on a technology basis, we know who to go to. On the funding side, you know, Unlimited should definitely have a list. Who are the five, six people that an early stage entrepreneur can go to for debt and just make that link? Um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the talent side, um, where, I mean, one of the most consistent things we hear, people come, to this, uh, come, come into the space with a new idea, new business, but don't really know where to hire, say, tech talent. Um, let's make sure that you've got the right connections. And so it's not just knowing a lot of people, um, it's knowing the right people and making the right relationships um, to solve particular problems. Some of, those, some of those mentorship linkages we've also seen have been trying to link very, very, very senior people in organizations who are living 10,000 miles away and linking them to organizations that are sitting in rural India. And they might be able to come in and be lobbed in for a board meeting or two, but what might actually be even more helpful is to find somebody you might not have heard of who's just a mid-level, fast-moving, incredibly switched-on person who's actually from that geography in, that, in India. Um, probably far more interesting to a business than, than a twice-a-year interaction with somebody sitting in San Francisco. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I think that probably needs to change a bit. I think that's an important point. I think that things, there are connector organizations, but the investment that actually has to go behind a connector organization to link the right people is something that I think is overlooked. And actually getting feedback and refining that is something that's very, very rarely done. Other questions? Well, if I don't see... A, a lot of questions out there. I'm going to actually ask a couple of questions. I think there were some extremely interesting observations that were made during the initial piece, and I resisted the temptation of jumping in at that stage. But one of the things actually was talking about the fact that you mentioned it, Paul, and then I think you picked it up again, is learning from each other, learning about what works, and even more important, what doesn't work. 
So I'm actually going to be hard-nosed and ask each of you, you have worked with so many organizations. How have you actually shared the negative learnings to other players? And what do you think can be done if you've not been able to do it in the past? So I'm actually going to start with you, because you work on the finance end where there's a lot of learning. How do you, have you shared that learning of what has not worked with other people in the field? No, so one ratio I must tell you, I mean, we, we claim that we have funded about 40 enterprises, but the other ratio is that we have evaluated more than 220 enterprises, <laughs> which essentially means that we have uh, effectively said no to about 180. The, the reason why I'm saying this is because, and if I look at the metrics of, uh, uh, or the reasons of rejections uh, of those 180, uh, uh, some of them are really, well, you have, you have to work on these five, six areas before before you can actually access any capital from us. Uh, what has happened is, uh, with some of the enterprises among that 40, they were early in the different bucket. Uh, once we have shared the learnings, which, which, which essentially was that, you know what, you're not maintaining your books properly, you're not uh, uh, managing the cash flow properly, I don't know whether you understand your uh, projections well enough, or you are, uh, you're not really uh, 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 making your contract with your clients uh, uh, watertight. Uh, once we have been able to communicate that properly and uh, we have seen that they have actually uh, implemented those, uh, we, we feel comfortable because uh, that essentially is a fact of the matter that they have uh, uh, implemented what we were trying to tell them. One example with on a no-name basis I must tell you, uh, we recently funded a company in the BC space, banking correspondent. And uh, they had to uh, undergo uh, a bit of restructuring in the past. And uh, there was one observation during our due diligence which we wanted to uh, convey and uh, which was basically effective utilization of certain reserves that they maintained. Uh, and we are glad to tell you that uh, the board which initially pro uh, objected to the particular utilization, uh, uh, after our suggestion and after our feedback, uh, the board finally uh, said yes and the board comprised of people from various banks in that company. Uh, so those are the learnings we try to share with our, uh, with our enterprises and they actually uh, uh, implement that and, and that's actually good. That's great. Srijit, could you share sort of how you've <coughs> benefited yeah. from failures and got other people to benefit from So that? we basically try to do it at three levels. One is, as Sanjeev said, the feedback loop to the, the same enterprise. How do we actually uh, help with their practices and uh, compliance or reporting or uh, whatever issues we feel, uh, we find. And I mean, the challenges are there, I mean, or what our experience are pretty much the same, whether it is, I mean, closing your accounts every month or reconciling the financial reports or uh, having, even having, I mean, if you are hiring, a cl having a clear role description and help them to come up with a, the ideal role description for a new management person to be hired or in e each of these areas. Then the next level is basically sharing between the partners and uh, we have seen that Especially when you have more than one enterprise from the same sector, the learnings are, uh, I mean, very much applicable across uh, enterprises. And the third level now at the sector level, something which we are just starting, uh, we are, uh, so we, as I shared earlier, we have something called a knowledge practice or SPM practice, which was restricted to our partners, where we uh, st come st first start with the baseline and then study the progress at each and every stage, and also try to understand the specific challenges they face. Now we are actually taking that to a sector level. We are uh, institutionalizing that knowledge practice and trying to bring the learnings out. For example, we work with a company in the dairy sector. And in, the distribute, in this particular model of uh, distributed milk collection, we see that the challenges are actually, I mean, uh, applicable at the sector level. And we have tremendous uh, learnings there. So how do we, uh, I mean, bring those learnings to the uh, sector level. There are other enterprises working at that, uh, in that model. And similarly, crafts or uh, rural manufacturing or, or even uh, region specific. We have now two partners in Northeast and we are discussing with more. So the Northeast of India uh, present actually a unique set of challenges. And whether it, if it comes to logistics or in any of these areas, they have actually unique set of challenges and sometimes unique solutions also. So how can we actually, I mean, disseminate that to a, a larger uh, uh, audience outside? So that's something which we are trying to do, and uh, my colleague, Josna, is here, she's uh, driving that. And yeah, so 
pretty much uh, these are the three levels we try to address. So could you tell us on the third level how are you doing it? Because there's a challenge of the individual organization and what is confidential to them and their secret versus sharing it with the world. So yeah. how do you actually handle that tension? Well, so of course, I mean, you cannot share any specific confidential information, but so we are just starting that and but some of the ways we are planning to do is one, uh, as I told you, like either, uh, I mean, at, identify that areas, whether it's the diary sector or Northeast India. So identify some of those, I mean, uh, uh, focus areas. And then it could be case studies, it could be uh, uh, like uh, what we call white papers about that particular uh, area. So we are exploring a number of ways to do that. At the moment we have, uh, I mean, pretty good case studies of baseline reports and impact reports of each of our uh, enterprises we work with from which we also try to look at the individual, how like, how for example, how did a particular, uh, a transformation happen to a particular family and what, uh, I mean, normally when we talk about impact, it's a lot, lot about, we know there is impact, but how actually the impact happened and what are the aspects of impact? Is it just the income increase and how did even the quality of life improve? And how did that, call, that income increase resulted in that particular family accessing other services, uh, whether it's increasing the, uh, expenditure on uh, uh, more uh, nutrients or uh, education or healthcare. So we try to look at these and then try to, I mean, how do we, uh, I mean, make more generic, not sharing very confidential, but more generic uh, knowledge out of it, which can be shared with uh, larger public. That's something we're trying to do. Simon, I'm going to ask you that because that's something which I know you've struggled with, is how yeah. do you take the learning, especially the negative learnings, and share them out? It's tricky. Well, we published, we're not a report writing organization. We published a report, which sounds incredibly boring, but we, after 10 years of being in existence, we put a report out saying, what, what have we learned <coughs> and what were the failures? And of course, we didn't talk about this grantee was a disaster or not. What we talked about was what kind of general models didn't work or not. Um, uh, we found a lot of failure and we, we put it out there. And I think foundations in particular, the whole, the, the whole philanthropic sector is incredibly guilty of a lack of transparency. You pick up any foundation annual report, it will talk about the successes, it will never talk about what, what messed up this year. Um, and so what we, <laughs> we, tr we tried to sort of start breaking that and started actually to track out of all of our grantees, who, what, percentages, what, what percentage has succeeded, what percentage has failed. We started with an 80% failure rate when we were 14, um, 13, 14 years old as a foundation. It's now less than that. but. Um, I mean, Paul and I have battle scars uh, trying to get uh, microfinance institutions to distribute uh, products, uh, which don't do uh, it. Which uh, <laughs> back then sounded like a good idea, but um, that was a failure. We've had a lot of failure around um, trying to turn NGOs or nonprofit structures into for profits. Um, a lot of a lot of capital wasted. But I'll just make one quick general point, which is that. We actually think failure is a, is a good thing and it tends to be discussed in terms of, well, how, how successful have you been and let's not talk about the failure, what have been the successes? Actually, the question I think that needs to be asked more is, why aren't you failing more? If you're an organization like ours that has philanthropic capital um, uh, to, pl to put to play, or even if you're an early stage equity investor, if, you're, if we don't have an 80% plus failure rate, I'd say we're actually doing something wrong. We should be, if we're, we're, we're probably not taking enough risk. Um, so I think the, the, the question is how do we, and Ashish, I think you got it right, is how do, you, how do you fail quickly but then learn from it and disseminate those learnings? Um, but we don't, in public uh, locations, talk about specific uh, organizations and, and what they, because many of them are still around. Um, it's tough. Yep, and I think it is, I'll come back to that, but Paul, why don't you give us your yeah. thoughts because again, I mean, you've dealt on this in many dimensions. We think about this in a lot of different ways. One, one is at the level of even just us as a team making investment decisions. I think we are uh, uh, pretty, pretty ruthless with each other and talking about what worked, what didn't work, what can we learn from past decisions. That, that happens behind closed doors. That also happens in one-to-one -one dialogues with particular investors and that's sort of more at the investment process feedback level. Within our portfolio, we're very, we're very new investor. We've been investing for about 18 months now. Um, and so um, actually we've, we've joked, but kind of been serious. We haven't had a company fail yet. Um, um, maybe we're really good investors. Um, maybe we're not taking enough risks. Uh, maybe we should be, um, um, I don't know, striving for 80%. Tough thing about failure is when you fail, you don't know if you failed because you just sucked or because there was something really, you gave it a you know, best shot and you really learned something. And so 
um, without really ever knowing that. Um, um, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to, to know what to conclude on the basis of something not working out. And it's interesting, you ask five different people um, um, what didn't work. I was at SKS for, for a few years, um, and uh, um, I, I, there are a lot of viewpoints about what went wrong with SKS. I certainly have a very strongly held view of what went wrong with SKS. Um, I recently got in a debate with someone who also was very close to it, who had a totally different view about what went wrong. So there's also these narratives that form about failure that are tough to, uh, to track. I think one of the things we're trying to do, like I said, is um, put more resources, hopefully it's going to be grant-funded resources, against this function of sharing lessons, positive, negative, from our portfolio to a broader set of actors who could actually do something with them. I think the other thing we want to do is give more opportunities for people to sit in the same room and learn from each other. Um, we're really excited that we're going to be launching this year with CGAP a, uh, I don't know, I can't remember what we're calling it, like a, uh, some sort of inclusion CEO summit, um, where uh, we'll bring in, in together into a closed room session, 40, 50, whatever it is, of the top financial inclusion CEOs, no investors, no funders, sit there and learn from each other. Um, set up some of the, uh, the challenging areas that people um, we know they're having problems with, selling to enterprises, hiring talent, um, uh, uh, value chains and distribution, um, and then hear them talk. Um, and, and we're hoping that we can create an environment where people feel comfortable not shouting from the rooftops via case studies what worked, what didn't, but more uh, um, um, sharing amongst a smaller group of people who can actually use that information in real time to inform particular decisions um, and hopefully we can find those, uh, you know, cultivate more of those linkages. But certainly I think it's something we need to spend more time on, um, sharing the positives as well as the negatives. Anybody from the audience like to talk about the need for learning from failures or thoughts about whether we should be sharing failures? Um, as donors, you know, we're always looking for um, sort of examples out there to scale up. But where we come up with the challenge is India is so diverse socially, economically, culturally, institution-wise, resource-wise. So we, many times we come up with this challenge of how do you find a scale model that actually addresses this? And one thing I think would be very beneficial actually at the regional levels, if we can start getting the learning together of what works in certain sectors, certain regions, certain areas. So am I correct in hearing that there is no platforms like that at this point, and people are using their own different modalities to address this issue? You're in the platform. This is it. This is the closest that there is, yeah. yeah. No, but I think that's a great point. In fact, what, again, sort of hearing all these comments, it really brings home a couple of different things because this is an area that we have talked about a lot internally, and I think it really came out of our report blueprint to scale. When we were going out there and asking people, why do you not scale? What's the organizations you met with? We had hundreds of stories of failures. And then when we said, can we actually share the story with anyone else? Immediate answer was no. Apart from a few players, <laughs> and I will say hats off to Acumen, because the whole blueprint to scale report was started because Acumen came and told us, there's too much froth in the market. Can you bring out why people are not succeeding? And we said, sure, that's an interesting idea. And what they said, we will share our entire portfolio with you. You can take them, you can rip them apart, and you can actually share the problems. And that was an offer we could not refuse, so we got into it. And when we got into it, we really realized how tough it was sharing the negatives. So I think first and foremost, let's accept it, that that is not accepted. Which then brings us to how do we start actually developing a culture of actually sharing the negative stories. And that's where I think you know, people like Shell Foundation can actually have the courage of standing up there and saying, here's my portfolio. 80% failures. That's exactly what we need. Mm. I think what you're talking about, groups of people getting together to share failures. We really need to start building more of a culture of sharing failures. And that's what will get the debate out. Why did SKS fail? Unless people can start talking about it, that's not going to happen. I have my own theory also. I guess it's still in business, I should say. But yes. yes. Well, <laughs> we, there's a debate about what is business. It's still yeah. in business, I suppose. No, but definitely. And I think that really yeah. leads Ashish, to... Ashish, if I may just add to that. But talking Please. about failure, one big thing we all need, uh, whoever is working in the sector, need to uh, do is to somehow save our entrepreneurs from any fear of failure. And that's actually a big hindrance to entrepreneurship. And it's okay to fail at the enterprise level and, I mean, pick up from there and maybe, I mean, uh, try next time. That culture, that attitude has to come, especially in India. 
And especially if you go to smaller towns, that whole family pressure, and if you're a failure, you will not get uh, a good marriage to, I mean, uh, your fa parental pressure, everything works there. So take ri taking risk, uh, removing that any fear for failure, that's something which we all need to work. I absolutely think so. I think it's the whole issue of a culture of failure. Go ahead. I have a quick thought on uh, failure. Um, I run a very early stage lending startup. And the way th we think of failure is really not something that is deterministic, but a controlled failure where it doesn't wipe you out, but you actually learn from it to live another day. And, and for that, you know, when I, when I talk to a lot of lenders, I, I hear that everybody has a 99.9% .9 you know, good loans and only 0.1%. We think that we would want to have 5 to 10% bad loans to, in, the, in the early stages. And that's what we think of as controlled failure so that we can learn from it vast in our net and kind of like with time actually get to a 99.9 percent. So thank you. I thank think you. that's part of the culture of failures, knowing how to learn from them, knowing how to experiment, pushing up, just as you said, that if you actually had 100 percent successes, you'd actually have a problem with that. I think that's a very good way of actually learning from it. The last thing I'd like to just do on that failure piece, sorry, I have one more comment, so I'm going to take that before I yeah. wind just, up on the failure piece. Just a question on this, this whole issue of failure and, and the scale question that came up. Often, uh, often, especially, especially directed to Srijit, given you know the kind of entrepreneurs you work with. Often, do we, uh, do we, act, is the ambition of scale sometimes so through mentoring through this imposed so much that you push someone to failure? Because perhaps, I mean, what do you call a failure? If 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 there was an enterprise at a particular scale, I, I think this whole issue of scale, the unit scale. And the connection of that unit scale to success or failure, and the issue of scalability is non-trivial. There could be enterprises working at a certain scale, and you push them, you try to push them beyond that scale, and you drive failure. So is there a different way to think about scalability, given the kind of problems, the kind of diversity, the kind of capacities there exists in entrepreneurs all over? Is replication and, 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 and the idea of replication something we need to think about. Good point. I'm going to keep that, park that for a minute. I just want to wind up the question on failure because I think there's a theme here which is important. And all of us need to be thinking about it. How do we actually develop a culture of recognizing failure and learning from it? Not necessarily sort of idolizing it either, although for a while it may be good to get to that particular stage. But the last thing I want to just say is that this is where I think, and I've had this conversation with many of the panelists actually at an individual level, is where foundations and grant capital can play a role. At the end of the day, one of the things the grant capital actually brings with it is some level of power. And I actually find funders too scared to use that power. But at the end of the day, that's part of the deal. I'm giving you public good, you create public good. And I think all of us who are involved with foundations should be pushing foundations to say, yes, give money, but then whatever the learnings are there should actually be openly shared. You want the money which is coming without, a, you know, without a big reward at the end of it, that's great. But then at least share the reward in another way with other people. Now, I know I just have a few minutes left. So what I'd like to do is actually move one step beyond this. And if I can have the last couple of slides, I'd appreciate if you could bring the slides back in. Excuse me, can we get the slides? So basically, what I want to just try to sum up this whole thing was, it's been a fascinating conversation. And I think you've seen every person on this audience even somebody like Sandeep, who's basically in the money business, <laughs> talks about the fact that there is more than individual organizations need more than just money, and whether it is outsourcing HR functions, talent, everybody has talked about. Management bandwidth in one way or the other, everybody has talked about. And I think there's interesting players like Unlimited who can provide some of those things, but making the connections come alive, actually making sure they match, and they're not just being thrown together, are a very, very important part. But I'd like to then move on to the other piece, which is also a number of issues came out here, which are beyond the individual. It is basically, at the end of the day, in Delhi Group, providing working capital across organizations. It's the point that Simon made about industry associations. It's the point about learning being shared. So what I'd like to do in that tail end is just move to the work we've been doing, because I think that's really the area where we focused on, and it could be a nice way of actually setting the end to this panel. So I talked about the fact that why do you actually get to scale and why do you not get to scale? What I've 
I was going to say with the report we've just, re uh, we've just released beyond the pioneer, getting industries to scale talks exactly about this. And the word it uses is industries. It's not individual organizations, which comes back to your point about scale. We don't necessarily have each organization got to scale. The point which you were making about really pioneering organizations come up with interesting ideas. We need to f not expect every individual organization to scale, but can we get it to get the whole industry to scale? So that's the challenge we set out on. We spent a year looking at different organizations, talking to different experts, and a common theme actually came out. So what we noticed was that what we noticed was that for a lot of the organizations that actually did land up scaling, they actually had help beyond the organization itself. Now, what this gives us some of the final lessons, but basically organizations like USAID, like DFID, there are a bunch of interesting organizations which think beyond the individual organization and try to go out and help. The Gates Foundation has been one of them, which has actually worked on mobile money with Vodacom. And I'm not going to go into details, but what that report does is show examples of different players who have actually worked at the industry level above the individual organization and what they have been able to do. And it's fascinating, because when you take that lens away from the individual organization and the broader organization, Shell Foundation has done that. These are pioneering organizations that have gone beyond the individual enterprise. And this report actually lays out what the value of that is and how it can be done. And actually a call to everyone in this room to start thinking about how do you start engaging beyond the enterprise. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I'm just going to say, any one of you who wants a copy of that report, please feel free. We've got them outside A2. The door for A2 has copies of the report. And I'd like to once again thank the panel. Very fortunate to have all of you here. And appreciate your spending the time thinking about this before you came into the room and the comments that you had. And also thank all of you for participating and being part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish.